So hello everybody. Uh, I hope you have a good evening and join our webinar today from a beautiful city in Turkey called Adana. I am Dr. Yüksel and this is my colleague Dr. Bendi Dayı. Hello dear colleagues. I hope you enjoyed this webinar with us today. Yes, we actually um, are here to present you our new findings uh, about the boring technique. As you know, we presented a lot about the boring technique, the concept, the clinical results, but we haven't uh, still have enough data collected from the scientific point of view. And this we would like to close this gap with this webinar and the ongoing publications. Uh, as you can see, uh, we are in Turkey. We are very south where the blue point is. This is a city called Adana. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful landscape. Here we are at a huge, nice river called the Seyhan River. It's a very modern city, uh, very warm. Today we had approximately uh, 25 degrees every was yeah. it a little bit <laughs> was, so yeah. we we switch on the air conditioning and the car so it was hot uh, sorry for the guys in europe <laughs> where they are suffering a little bit the cold and uh, adana is famous for very delicious adana kebab as you see on the screen and orjan i am sure that you are looking forward to eating adana kebab again tonight I after the webinar after the webinar yes <laughs> yes that we will do Shukrova University is one of the major and leading universities in Turkey with modern substructure and facilities. And as you see, Shukrova University is located just near the lake with a beautiful uh, landscape. This is the Faculty of Dentistry building and uh, Faculty of Dentistry is celebrating 25th anniversary this year. Now we are giving this webinar from the Faculty of Dentistry. You know that uh, unfavorable local conditions due to atrophy, trauma, and periodontal disease may cause insufficient bone volume and unfavorable interlarge relationship. In this condition, it is not possible to place the implants in a correct position. So many techniques have been developed to reconstruct these deficient ribs in order to place the implants in the correct positions uh, with one stage or in two stage surgeries after a period of graft healing. In majority of cases, autogenous block bone grafting is usually preferred uh, as a two-stage procedure, because in this case, autogenous block bone graft uh, is harvested and then placed into the deficient site. And uh, after a period of four or five months of healing, implants can be placed uh, into this uh, augmented area as a two-stage procedure. So actually, what we do with the bone rig is, if we have not enough bone volume, we just place a piece of bone, normally in the past it was the autogenous bone, together with the correct positioned uh, implant in a one stage. So that gives us in the first moment the stabilization of the bone graft and later on this implant was used to build the prosthetical construction. It is a one-step procedure. This is very important that we do not have a second stage surgery. And of course, reducing the pain and also the healing time. Because when the bone is healed, also the uh, implant is also integrated. So this has these two big advantages, this technique. Where we harvested the bone, mostly we use the chin. Of course, we can use the palatal area or we can use in the retromolar region. We have different type of bone harvesting areas in the mandible and the maxilla. Mostly we use the chin area. But as you know, chin area 
if you don't do this surgery very often, has also some disadvantages like uh, minimal morbidity. Uh, of course, we have pain, edema, and even the fracture risk of the of this uh, harvested bone was uh, reported. And uh, the other problems like the graft exposure or the implant failure and uh, graft resorption problems are similar to the all autogenous bone um, augmentation cases. This is nothing different when we use a bone uh, ring uh, as a normal uh, harvesting um, autogenous bone and placing in a one-step or two-step procedure. There is not a major um, differences in the healing of the bone. But just imagine you have a, another product where you can take from your drawer and use the advantages of the um, boring technique, but with the allograft. So that means you don't need to spend time on the surgery. You can place this product into the recipient site. Everything goes very fast and even a little bit non-experienced surgeons like the general dentist could perform this surgery when they have a need. The only one problem, we knew that the allografts has been used since 40 years in the dental field, but we haven't have enough data in this very um, specific way of usage, first of all in the boring, and there was not data available, the comparison between the allograft and the autogenous bones. So basically you can compare two good working systems with each other, but which one is the best? This question we could only answer with a study that we performed here at the university. It was an animal study. For this study, we created two defects. One defect is one millimeter, and the other defect is three millimeter. We took a five millimeter autogenous bone, and five millimeter, of course, allograft. So when you place this autogenous bone or the allograft into these defects, you have a two millimeter and four millimeter vertical, uh, let's say, uh, augmentation sites. So uh, we have 10 millimeter of bone rings coming normally from the uh, from the Otis production. So what we did, we cut it into half. All these um, bone rings, what we used, either autogenous or the allograft, were in the seven millimeter outside diameter, and of course 3.5 millimeter in the inner diameter. So we basically compared autogenous and allograft in the same conditions. To just show you a drawing, which also one of our uh, faculty members did this drawing by hand, so we have a lot of talented people here in, the, <laughs> in Adana. He said um, he's also a surgeon uh, and he made these very nice drawings. That explain you very simple that all the grafts are having the same size, size. Sorry, on the left side you see the autogenous, the lighter one mimics the allograft, this one is the allograft, and again autogenous and the allograft. So we, we said autogenous 2 millimeter group and auto, uh, on, or allograft 2 millimeter group or the autogenous 4 millimeter or the uh, allograft 4 millimeter. So we are basically comparing 2 millimeter vertical augmentation with 4 millimeter vertical augmentation, and we are comparing allograft to autogenous. So the first question, if I show you these drawings, it would ask you who will show us the best histomorphometric results. Of course, we would say, Less augmentation, 2 millimeter, is always better than 4 millimeter in, um, for the final outcome. And of course, autogenous. So let's say the first picture, what you see, should be the best. So this is what we 
clinically um, uh, made a photo just to show you also how it looks clinically and be used for this study uh, not only one animal so that we can also evaluate the data with the n is eight factor you can see completely where we harvested the bone and how we place the bone for autogenous and for allograms. So everything we closed under the JSON membrane, like under the normal conditions, what we would do the surgery in the patient's mouth, only we didn't use here additional filler material like cerebone because we didn't want to um, see any artificial material, only solely autogenous empty allograms. So this is basically the picture after the sacrificing of the animal. And here, there is the red line is visible, is all the um, eight borings with the implants basically covered by autogenous bone. So from one perspective, it is very nice to see this result. But what is, if you look to the uh, histomotoretic analysis? In this experimental study, uh, two sheep were autonized after four months, and the other two sheep were autonized after eight months of healing. Now, uh, I will try to answer the questions of origin because he asked some questions on the schematic drawing, which is the best, which is the worst, or something like this. So we will try to answer this uh, by uh, doing the histomorphometric analysis and also histological evaluation. At, after the sacrification process, the bone biopsies, including the implants, were harvested and processed into the undeclassified ground sections. And also, we performed this undeclassified ground section uh, preparing procedure in our dental faculty uh, in the laboratory of dental uh, faculty now we will show you uh, the results of also histomorphometric analysis now uh, on the screen you can see the four months histological uh, sections of each group these are autogenous group and these are allografts group as you see in the autogenous two millimeter and autogenous four millimeter group, we can see good bone healing, lamellar bone healing, mature bone healing. But if you look at the four millimeter autogenous augmentation group, this is the best. This is the excellent bone healing and consolidation after four months. When we evaluated the allograph groups, two millimeter allograph group and four millimeter allograph group, after four months of healing, we see we observe we still observe allografts. There are still remnants of allograft particles because allografts did not resolve completely. But as you see, there are new bone penetrated into the allograft, and also there is a connection with the allograft and the implant and also with the recipient bone after four months of healing. These are the histological sections of eight months results. Again, autogenous and allografts. Now, there are some differences in the autogenous groups. When we compare with the four months results, four months histological sections, we observe some large bone marrow spaces, both in two millimeter augmentation group and four millimeter augmentation group. And this is this resorption may be due to uh, unloaded implants because they are unloaded implants and long waiting uh, periods may cause this large bone marrow spaces and resorption in the autogenous group but when we evaluated the allograft groups two millimeter and four millimeter groups we observed that both in two millimeter and four millimeter groups, allograft bone ring completely replaced, uh, completely resorbed and replaced with mature bone. And there is a bone, good bone connection with the implant, both in allograft and allograft two millimeter and four millimeter groups after 
eight months of healing. I would like to show this schematic growing again. Uh, Orjan already mentioned it, uh, talk about it. For the histomorphometric analysis, we compared two millimeter groups each other and four millimeter groups each other. Now, I will show you the histomorphometric results. This is the table of the histomorphometric analysis, four months results and eight months results. Each group you can see, and uh, we evaluated, we analyzed bone area and bone implant contact percentage for each group. After four months of healing, when we compare autogenes and allograft 2 millimeter groups, autogenes is, is uh, better than allograft group after four months. But after eight months, allograft is better than autogenes group, 2 millimeter group, in terms of bone area after eight months. When we evaluated bone implant contact percentage, autogenes is better than allograft after four months, but after eight months, allograft is better than autogenes group in terms of bone implant contact percentage. When we compare autogenes four millimeter and allograft four millimeter groups in terms of bone area percentage, we found that after four months of healing, autogenes is better than allograft group. But after eight months, as you see, we have comparable results between these groups, similar results after eight months. When we evaluated bone implant contact percentage, autogenous group is better than allograft group after four months. But after eight months, again, allograft group and autogenous group have similar results after eight months of healing. This graphic clearly shows these results, clearly summarizes these results, actually. This is the bone area percentage graphic, four months of healing, eight months of healing. And as you see, autogenous groups are better than allograft groups after four months. But after eight months, we observe similar results. Even the allograft two millimeter is better than autogenous 2 millimeter group in terms of bone area percentage. And we saw the similar things, similar results in the bone implant contact percentage analysis. After four months, autogenous is better than allograft, but after eight months, allograft groups have similar results with the autogenous group. We think that when we wait, more than four or five months of healing for autogenous groups. We saw, also we saw it in the histological sections, we have some bone resorption because these are unloaded implants. And to wait uh, more than four months is disadvantaged for uh, autogenous bone rings. But you get very good, very, uh, uh, very good results, excellent results with the allograft bone rings if you wait eight months. So the findings of the study, uh, we saw that boring technique is a reliable and predictable alternative procedure for vertical augmentation of alveolar defects. We already know this. Within the limits of the study, we also found that allograft boring looks promising in augmentation of surgically created vertical bone defects around implants after eight months of healing. But further studies are required in order to evaluate the loading time of the implants placed with autogenous or allograft boring technique. These were the experimental results of the bone rings, but what's happening in the clinics? What we have uh, regarding the clinical data if we use autogenous or allograft bone ring. Yeah, I mean, from this uh, animal study, we can be today sure that the allografts, after a certain period of time, having the same bone implant contact at the same amount of bone. 
So from our point of view, now our view to the allograms completely changed because this is probably the only one study that has compared the autogenous and the allograms in the same vertical defects, right? Yes. So because we published this uh, article already, mm -hmm. we submitted it, it was accepted. Mm -hmm. And within this year is it now under publication in, the, in oral implant research, um, mm -hmm. which you also know has a very high impact factor, is a nice uh, magazine. So um, you can also read the complete article. Uh, I think we solved the, for us the question, which one is better? Uh, there is no better. Both are good. With the autogenous bone, we have to wait uh, less healing time mm -hmm. and try to load the implants after four to five months. And probably with the allografts, we have the same amount of bone implant contact or the bone value after eight months. But that doesn't mean that after five months, the implants cannot be loaded because we have, even in four months, sufficient bone implant contact that could allow us to load these implants. But however, uh, we need more clinical data. And we decided to continue this research and we got the permission uh, from the ethic committee to run a study with um, patients here in this faculty um, with two groups of patients, sinus augmentation procedures and the all other vertical augmentations, either in the aesthetic zone or in the free end situation, in the lower jaw. So what we have the most um, here is uh, from the population uh, we can expect. Uh, but we didn't just decide to use only allografts. We still continued this study with the uh, autogenous and allografts, which we will explain you. As you know, I mean, alveolar bone resorption uh, after sinus permeization, after the extraction, is a very well-known procedure. We extracted to it. We start the uh, uh, sinus uh, volume changes and also the atrophy in the bone. So probably one day uh, you have all those patients in your clinic, you end up with the class 5 or even class 6 patients. So what is the normal procedure in this uh, type of um, sinus uh, augmentation uh, cases, we perform two-stage sinus augmentation if the residual bone is less than four millimeter. So sometimes three millimeter. But it is below three millimeter. All of us know to stabilize the implant is too weak. We can end up with the implant into the sinus. So therefore, we just augment the patient, wait nine months, six months, and then open again the side and place the um, implant and wait again another time. So what if we would have this technique, doesn't matter in autogenous or in the allograft, if we would use it in the sinus to stabilize the implant. So this is um, the study actually what we run and we have from each group 20 patients that we can also have enough data to compare clinically both um, in the science. So the sinus augmentation procedure, Emre will explain you how we do. Okay, thank you, Orjan. Uh, in this actually pilot study this is a prospective pilot study now we are still ongoing uh, this uh, study and we will share some data with you uh, we have the, the study consists of two groups or already mentioned 
uh, sinus augmentation with autogenous boring and sinus augmentation with allograft boring uh, uh, to patients who have less than four millimeter residual alveolar height. In group one, uh, we perform uh, sinus augmentation and simultaneous implant placement by using autogenous boring. Now, we will show you two cases uh, with this uh, autogenous boring groups. This is the first case. As you see, there is uh, a dentulous part in the right posterior maxillary region. When we measured the residual alveolar bone height in the CT, uh, we found 2.8 millimeter uh, residual alveolar bone height. Normally, these uh, situations are required uh, two-stage sinus augmentation procedure, but we performed one-stage procedure with autogenous boring. The bone window was uh, opened with a diamond burr, the sinus is elevated, and the implant beds are prepared in the same session. And then the autogenous boring, which was harvested from symphysis, is used in these patients and the implants were placed through the uh, boring and the remaining space is uh, filled with cerebone and the bone window closed with Jason membrane. And in this study, we wait eight months for bone graft healing. And after eight months, we measure the implant stability by using OSTEL. And as you see in this patient, we got 75 ISQ value after eight months of healing. When we, and after, thereafter, we place healing caps. And as you see, there is a very good bone regeneration around the implant after eight months of healing in the periapical radiograph. Also, you can see favorable bone regeneration in the CBCT after eight months of healing. So this is the second case. Please uh, focus on the right posterior maxillary region. And CBCT evaluation showed us there is almost no bone, maybe one millimeter bone under the sinus, and we plan to place implants. And again, we plant uh, boring technique here again. Uh, we harvested autogenous boring from symphysis. And then uh, we placed the implant to, uh, into the autogenous boring after uh, sinus elevation. And in these patients uh, that we perform sinus augmentation and simultaneous implant placement with auto, uh, autogenous or allograft borings, we always use and also we recommend using a fixation cap because fixation cap is necessary in sinus augmentation with borings. Fixation cap has a larger diameter than the implant shoulder. So it uh, also provides more stability for the implant during the healing phase. So you need this fixation cap if you perform sinus augmentation with bone rings. And again, we place cerebone in the sinus. And this is the post-operated first week radiograph, panoramic radiograph. In CBCT, we can observe the boring and the graft around the implant. And again, we waited eight months. And after eight months of healing, we can see very good bone regeneration in the periapical radiograph and in the CBCT. Even the patient in, the, in this region, the patient had just one millimeter or less than one millimeter residual alveolar bone height. Uh, the implant is really ready for loading after just eight months of healing and one stage procedure with the bone ring technique. So that means the technique from this perspective is great. And um, if you ever should perform the second stage um, surgery, your patient would ask you 
don't you anything know about the boring? You can shorten the time into one operation only. Uh, good that some patients doesn't know it. But what happens if we do this with the max graft? That means with the other graft forms. This was the second question. Do we have enough, after eight months, enough ISQ values? As you can see here, the same situation, again, 2.4 millimeter of residual bone, which is quite less to uh, place the implants without any further fixation. Just the same procedure as Emre described. We lift the Schneiderian membrane. We gain the space to fill it with um, the boring and additional cerebone. And you can see here one of the key elements, the bone ring, the implant, but also this fixation cap. Not many companies has this um, nice tool, but it is essential for this uh, augmentation procedure. Uh, here we have uh, performed this whole study with uh, bone level Strauman implants and also this um, was very important that Strava produced this fixation cap to uh, make this kind of uh, sinus procedures possible for everyone. So when you see the after the first week the situation that your implant is fixed, especially here in this area, here you have the very thin bone, uh, your implant is in the sinus, and this gap here, what you see, uh, is the bone, and the head of the screw is outside. So don't think that is a misfitting of the um, screw. No, this is designed like this, that you have uh, this kind of gap, because you are fixing the implant with the, uh, with the uh, fixation cap. So, um, we, of course, are doing here this um, CBCT scans to later on evaluate the volumetric changes. But first of all, I would like to share with you the ISQ values. After eight months, we have 80, uh, the number of 80 ISQ value for this kind of implants. And if you look to the chart, you see after 70, we are starting the high stability. So that means with 60 or with 65, we can already load our implants. I would say with 63 is no problem to load the implants or with 65, 70 is already high, but we have 80 in a sinus with almost zero or almost two millimeter, two and a half millimeter of bone, which is, I mean, after eight months, a very good result. Uh, of course, uh, we are taking comb beam CTs to see the final results. And again, a second case, just to demonstrate how we do this kind of cases uh, here, we have again zero bone. Like Emily described to you, uh, we have two and a half, three millimeter bone, and then we have almost less than one millimeter bone. Of course, we said that one millimeter bone is necessary, but here in this case was only maybe 0.6 millimeter of the bone. But as you can see, even in such cases, uh, the fixation with these tools, what we have in our hand, with the allograph boring, with the fixation caps, gives us sufficient stability to get really a final good result. As you say, see there again, this fixation cap. Here you see the uh, allograph boring. And we are just using the implant to stabilize inside and outside with the fixation cap, the position of the implant that you have very nice rigid fixation. 
all the other procedures like placing in this gap CSR bovine material, uh, covering everything under a collagen membrane, this doesn't change. So as you can see, after the first week, you hear the uh, X-ray, again, here the fixation cap that uh, looks a little bit uh, with a gap, which is normal because it fits directly into the cover screw. Uh, of course, we have all these data, and now you see 78 ice cube value. What it means? The bone, what is remaining bone, has no influence on the healing in the sinus. Because with 78 ice cube, with almost zero bone, residual bone, that shows that the bone graft or the allograft heals in the sinus after eight months. Perfect. Then we start, of course, the uncovering procedure with the gingival pharma after the eight months. And two weeks later, you can start to make the impression and load this. Uh, cases without any further question if you can really um, load it or not because uh, we have radiographically either on the uh, two-dimensional radiographs or three-dimensional radiographs enough bone or uh, it looks like a bone yeah and from the animal study we know it is a bone we have enough bone that we can trust so only one thing you shouldn't do during the time, this type of temporary dentures or full dentures are not allowed. Why it is not allowed? Because we are just giving from outside pressure on the soft tissue and this screw is not that, uh, let's say, stable because we don't have a residual bone can move the whole graft. So that's why whatever you do, no compression on this area on the soft tissue. Maybe if you have such a patient, they are, have to wear a denture, etc. You have to rethink if you can perform the surgery. Otherwise, you will lose the implants or they will not, let's say, heal, ossificate. In this prospective randomized clinical pilot study, uh, up to now, 10 patients were included. The patients were randomly assigned to the group. So in the autogenous boring group, we have four patients. and the allograft boring group, we have six patients. When we evaluated complications after, uh, during this healing period for the, these 10 patients, uh, sinus membrane perforation, which was less than 5 mm in diameter, was observed in one patient in allograft group, and this was repaired with uh, collagen membrane without any further complications. And temporary paresthesia was were observed in all patients in autogenous boring group, in four patients. Uh, on the other hand, leptations, infection, implant loss, implant failure, severe graft resorption was not observed in any patients. You can see the ISQ values of each implant after eight months of healing. Also, I would like to show that all implants were in the same diameter and length in this study. These are the boring types that we used and residual alveolar bone height which were, which were uh, measured in CBCT. And after eight months of healing, as you see, all implants, all ISQ values of implants were higher than 70 ISQ. That means high stability uh, according to the chart. And when we measured the mean ISQ values, Autogenous boring group and allograft boring group showed similar results. The mean result is 78, and they showed similar results after eight months of healing. 
which means high stability. This is also very important. In this study, we also measured the graph resorption rate. Graph resorption rate in CVCT of each patient after eight months of healing. In the literature, graph resorption rate was reported as 18 between 22% for bone substitutes and 45% for autogenous bone grafts in, in two-stage sinus augmentation procedures, but two-stage. As you know, we did this study in one stage with the bone ring. So we have uh, mean graft resorption in autogenous group, bone ring group almost 10%, in allograft bone ring group almost 9% which is also similar in terms of bone graft resorption. And these results are lower than the results reported in the literature. And this is a systemic review. Yes, this is a systematic review, which was published in uh, 2014 in, in, in International Journal of the Maxofacial Implants. And these are the results of this systematic review. And these are the results we measured in CBCT in terms of graft resorption after eight months of healing. In our study, yeah. Yes. So sinus augmentation with boring technique is a one-stage procedure. So you don't need to do it in two stage. It's a one-stage procedure, and it reduces overall treatment time which is very advantageous for all of our patients. Even the residual bone height is less than four millimeter. Also in our study, Orjan, you know that we perform also in the table we showed, we perform the sinus augmentation and boring procedure. Even the residual alveolar bone height is less than one millimeter. Yes. Because it is debate. So uh, there is some uh, conflict about this issue, but we didn't see any major complications even when we performed this procedure in the patients who had residual alveolar bone height less than one millimeter. What do you yeah. think about it? I mean, this is where I have to clearly say when if you read the uh, Max graft in, inside the paper in the packaging, the recommendation is not to use less than one millimeter. Yeah. It is only from the product liability. But here, we performed it even if it was less than one millimeter. Uh, of course, it is not safe. So the safety here is this bone. If you have a small fractures in this bone by uh, drilling or by screwing, mm -hmm. of course, the whole procedure can end up in the sinus. So you can, there is a high risk if your uh, remaining bone is less than one millimeter. This we have to say. But we said in between us, we made a, um, we made thoughts about it. We said, let's don't exclude this patient. Uh, if we know such a technique and there is a patient that's coming with 0 0.7, 0 0.6 millimeter of residual bone, we shouldn't say to this patient, sorry, we can't give you the services, but we are aware of the complications. So uh, if you can handle the complications, or the bone correctly, don't uh, be shy to help those people in a one-stage protocol. But of course, from the product liability, the manufacturer has to say, you have to be careful that you have enough bone to yeah, not undergo yeah. this risk. Also, this is an ongoing study. This is a pilot study now. We have just uh, have the results of 10 patients. Hopefully, uh, when we finish the whole study uh, with the high number of patients, uh, we will also share the results with you. Of course. Uh, in the next webinar. In the is next, that, maybe. In the that, next webinar. Also, uh, I would like to, sorry, uh, I would like to also say that if you, th these are the advantages. If you use boring technique in sinus augmentation, you can, according to our study, in, according to our pilot study, you can use it uh, in success. If the res even the residual bone height is less than four millimeter, and if you use allograft bone ring, also it avoids to use 
autogenous bornate, which have some donor side morbidity. So, um, of course, um, as we mentioned in the beginning, we are running uh, uh, another study. Um, we are uh, looking for the vertical augmentation procedures, which is also one of the uh, most important uh, indications for the boring. Um, we would like to uh, show you that where we started, I mean, this uh, type of augmentation procedures we have done almost uh, over 10 years ago. And this is a very old clinical uh, case. Uh, but today we know we are very, very successful when it comes to the long-term stability. And of course, uh, Bernd Kiesnagen, Thomas Nord, etc., me, myself, we publish uh, some articles recently also where we observe not more than one millimeter bone resorption around the, around the color. But this is uh, always from a certain pool of patients this is just data what we can collect, are able to collect. Uh, at the moment, we are going really uh, to treat the patients, take all the measurements, and evaluate all the results, randomized, etc. This is the advantage now what we are doing here. Mm -hmm. we, we know exactly since the beginning what is the outcome and how we can compare this data. Uh, as you can see, randomly, there were also cases where we had to place autogenous boring next to allograft in patients. And to see here the allograft and autogenous bone, and then later on, we really wanted to see what is the final result. But don't think we are making this kind of test, uh, placing one autogenous bone and one allograft at this patient there was not possible to place another autogenous bone ring from the chin. So we had to go uh, after the first harvesting procedures uh, to an alternative. So there was only allograft possible to uh, not, uh, let's say, open another side for the patient, to not injure the patient. Uh, so it was randomly, let's say, occasionally uh, happened uh, things from the clinical point of view, but it's very important. At that time, even, it's an old case, we didn't see any difference between the allograph and the autogenous bone. So from this point of view, exactly we know what we have to expect from the bone ring, either autogenous or the allograph. But to have some uh, clinical research with data which you can publish which you can compare, it is a randomized chosen patient. So if the patient's coming to the clinic, the software in the administration tells this is a autogenous bone case. So we do not uh, choose by ourselves or the secretary says, okay, this patient you can do allograft or, or autogenous bone. This is the advantage to work in the university and, and do this kind of things. Uh, also, we are uh, making the same study with the vertical bone augmentation. This is very important for us to see the resorption rates, the volume changes. Um, and therefore, I am really looking for the final result of this study, which will take approximately another six months or a little bit maybe more or less, depends on the uh, patient situation and the um, and the, yeah uh, and the surgeons here in the faculty, but we don't stop to make this kind of uh, clinical researches. So this all we will um, share with you. Not uh, possible today for this given moment, but we will share with you in the next webinar. Hopefully, we will do it next year latest. We will schedule this, and then we will give you also really measurable data, like we did on the animal study or partially in the sinus study as well. So you can uh, 
expect from us this kind of studies. Uh, the marginal bone loss uh, around the implants after 6 and 12 months was always something what uh, clinicians worldwide uh, ask this question. So, mm -hmm. Do you see any bone loss? Uh, we can only say, yes, we see a bone loss of one millimeter. That's why we place the implants one millimeter subcrestally. When you look to our clinical pictures, you see always the implants are placed one millimeter below the uh, margin of the bone ring. Uh, also, there are really very, very, uh, very important um, things like how to place the bone ring, what should be the height of the bone ring when you place somewhere where there is already bone resorption. This was not the aim to share the procedure of the bone ring. The aim was to show you uh, the reliability of allografts in comparison to the autogenous bone. But if you are interested, there are other webinars from our colleagues. They uh, are explaining uh, in detail how to use, just on the same website, uh, bodyswebinars.com. You can visit this website, look at this, uh, look at these procedures. It will give you a lot of information. And of course, you can come to the Bone and Tissue Day, to the Congress, where we will have also a lot of nice speakers talking on this topic. Uh, Emma, okay. I think we are. Mm -hmm. Almost yeah. running out of time. Out yeah. of time. We have still left a couple minutes. We do not want to disturb your mm. evening. Probably you are all hungry and want to go to eat something and uh, rest a little bit. These are our email addresses. If you think you have a question but you have not so much time to just sit another five minutes on okay. this webinar. Uh, you can write us. Yes. 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 That's why also, I would like to thank all my colleagues in my department. Yes. Please, we are happy to uh, answer your questions. Yes. And we are getting the questions. This is the first one. You want me to read it? Or? Yes. Uh, Ruta Rastenian, sorry for pronunciation. Hello, what type of implants could be used? With allograft boring, does the ring work only with ankylos or it is compatible with another implant system also? Please, Orjan, yeah. do you want to answer this? Yeah, very good question. When we started, we used uh, uh, ankylos mainly, but later on, um, I can only tell you there is no specific implant necessary to use with the implants. Only the manufacturer of the bone rings, the allografts, are having 3.3 and 4.1 inner diameter, which fits perfectly to the Strauman implants, but you can easily enlarge this 3.3 millimeter inner diameter and place a 3.5 or enlarge a little bit more with the burr of the implant system and place a 3.7 millimeter uh, implant or 3.8. So if you have a 4.5 diameter of implant, you can use the 4.1. Only you cannot enlarge too much. You have to leave a little bit uh, allograft around your implant that turns into bone. So that's why we are using mostly um, small diameter of implants, 3.5 was always per working very good, but 4.1 is also fine. So therefore, uh, you can run it I and mean, you can do the surgery with every implant system. Only the shape of the implant shouldn't be extra large on the collar region. It should be a mostly parallel wall or um, um, or a, a little bit, uh, let's say, uh, root form implant. So not that too much that goes uh, at the collar to a larger diameter. Mm -hmm. This is important. Well, the other question is, uh, Dr. Yurdan Uchar, it was interesting to observe that there was no correlation between the residual alveolar bone height and ISQ. Neither ISQ nor the graft resorption 
percentage was correlated with one height. How do you explain that? Yes, it's a very good question. Actually, it's also interesting that uh, residual alveolar bone height uh, did not affect the results. Yep. Isn't it, Orjan? Yep. It's also it's because we discuss each other these yep. uh, results. Uh, I think uh, we. I I think that uh, after eight months of healing, the grafted area also have a very good bone regeneration. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe close to the residual alveolar uh, bone density. So it can be maybe the answer, because density of the bone uh, was very good I think after eight is, months. I think really. it is something to do with the anatomy of the sinus. The graft material uh, get vascularized also from the internal part of the sinus, not only from the bone. So uh, if you expect that the bone grows or the vessels grows only from the bone, then uh, in the sinus is a to total different uh, structure. It comes also from the periosteum, uh, from periosteum, I say from the Schneiderian Schneider membrane. membrane yeah. and therefore, uh, the vascularization is very good in the sinus. It's a closed region, mm -hmm. and you get these results after eight months. This is the only one explanation. Okay. So you're done again as a comment. I believe this result is amazing. Since it means that even if there is no residual bone left, the technique still works. Thank you. We don't know. Uh, a little bit bone you must have. Without bone, it doesn't work. You <laughs> must fix the. Yeah, but uh, yes, it's it. It looks amazing now because normally you have to do it in two-stage surgery, but with boring technique, with autogenous or allograft boring, even with allograft boring, you can do it in one stage and uh, just in eight months. After eight months of healing. Uh, the implant is uh, ready for loading. Yes. Thank you, your donor. And the other question is, do you manage course program in Adana, Turkey? If yes, when will you manage? Thank you very much. Dr. Ufuk Gürsesli. Orjan. <laughs> we have do we course, plan any course? We have, of, of uh, course, we will do... Uh, in Turkey. Of course, we will do in Adana that we already talked. We should do it. Uh, when? We can't say right now because we are not prepared to this question yeah. uh, for sure. Uh, but if we do it in the near future, we will immediately um, announce it through the yeah industrial channels like Botis mm. or Strauman, whomever is interested. But to it looks there is a demand. Huh? Yeah, of course, yeah. as we know. In Frankfurt, we have uh, different courses. The next course is in two weeks. Um, I have not the exact date, but um, write us an email and we will send you if you are interested. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. There the is... other question is Dr. Osman Akunju. Sorry if I missed, uh, but is eight months waiting period with or without loading? If there isn't, what about bone resorption after loading? So the uh, the question is, uh, are we talking about the sinus or are we talking about the... Um, I think this is about sinus because eight months, we waited eight months for the sinus study. Without loading. Without loading, yes. Without loading. Uh, also, uh, doctor is asking uh, for the bone resorption after eight months. Uh, this is an ongoing study. Now we have the results of bone regeneration. I mean, implant placement in one stage and... Uh, after eight months of healing, now we have the results of bone regeneration results, ISQ values, or also volumetric change after eight months of healing. The other question is, Dr. Ezgi Aydın, should the harvested graft and the defected site preparation be in the same diameter? Um, no, actually, when you use the uh, autogenous bone ring technique, you have a different surgical kit. It's not the same kit that uh, the allograft kit, uh, surgical kit. The reason is when you harvest, wherever you harvest, let's say from the chin, you go with the trephine into the chin, but the inner diameter of the trephine harvesting the ring or, or determining the ring size. But if you create a ring bed, you are doing with the trephine bed 
but with the outer size. So that's why if you make, let's say, with 6 mm outside diameter the defect, you should use to harvest the rig with one side, one size bigger diameter so that in the end the harvested bone fits into the recipient side. I don't know if I could explain you this, but if uh, you really visit uh, the website, I hope in our first first uh, webinar with Bernd Giesenhagen, we just explained uh, all this. It, it should be in the in the, in the system, in internet, uh, in Buddhist website. There we I think we explained all these uh, procedures. Thank you, Dr. Raiden. And the other question is from Dr. Durguturna. Hello, could you help me about understanding that how fixation can cap can help prim primer stabilization of the implants in sinus segmentation with boring? Uh, and also, Dr. Nur Eylem Yorulmaz have the same has the same question. The answer is, uh, as we mentioned, the diameter of the fixation cap is more than the shoulder of the implant. So it uh, it's, fits. it's like, it's a, like head, a head on your head. Yeah, yeah. So it uh, stabilizes the implant to the re uh, residual bone. To the residual bone. So it helps stabilize stabilization of the implant. Otherwise, if you don't have any primary stabilization during placement of the implant into the boring, you cannot leave it like this. Uh, you should uh, actually neglect the procedure. Yeah. You should not go on the procedure. Uh, because you need primary stabilization after uh, placement of the implant or after uh, screaming of the fixation cap. Just imagine you place in the sinus the bone ring and place into the bone ring your implant. But if you don't have anything that holds the implant uh, outside, I mean, uh, prevents the implant to fall in into the sinus, the whole implant with the ring will fall out in the sinus, fall in. So this fixation cap has a larger head, larger than your osteotomy, because it is five millimeter uh, diameter or six millimeter and the diameter is larger than anyhow the osteotomy. So this cap holds the whole procedure to fall in, and the ring holds the implant to fall out. So when you screw it, then this uh, whole construction is rigidly fixed. Yeah. Both with, sides. With one millimeter of the bone. Yeah. But it is fixed. From outside, here, you, from outside, you have the cover screw. Inside you have the bone ring, it cannot fall down and it cannot go into the direction because here this uh, screw had fixed it. So it's, it's very logic, but you have to do, uh, if you really want to do it, you can ask your local uh, supplier to bring you just a dummy ring and also a implant, dummy implant with the fixation cap, so and then you can see. Also, I would like to add something uh, about the fixation cap. The cover screw or the fixation cap is different. Yes. Different from the normal closure screws. Because it has windings yeah. inside. Normally, it has only uh, just for your screwdriver. Yeah. The, uh, the geometry is for the screwdriver. But in this case, to be able to fix it, it's made with some uh, threads. Yeah, this is... Really, for the boring technique, it's called uh, fixation cap. It's sold also as a, as a, let's say, uh, in a packaging. Pack yeah, in the same package. Yeah, this is very important that good you mention it because yeah, yeah. you go to the surgery and they no. give you different item and you cannot you fix cannot it. fix it. Yeah, this is very you important. You need you need both uh, uh, closure screw and fixation cap together in the same package. Thank you, Dr. Turner and Dr. Yorulmaz. And the other question is, Dr. Erdogan, Özgür Erdogan, brilliant lecture. Thank you. My question, is it possibly to obtain boring from other region than symphysis? Yes. 
Yeah. This we mentioned. Yes. Uh, you can harvest from the palate, from the frontal palate, uh, palatal area if you have a missing uh, tooth. So if you miss a central incisor, you can easily go to the palate and go into the direction to the buckle from palate and you can harvest six, seven millimeter uh, bone ring without any big problem. And you can all also harvest from the retromolar region, but the quality of the bone is very cortical and to harvest the bone is a little bit difficult and the length is very much uh, limited. Thank you, Dr. Özgür Erdogan. The other question is Dr. Sam Omar. Do you fix the ring itself during fixing the fixation cap so the whole complex doesn't move during attaching the cap? Uh, actually, we fix the ring during the implant placement. I mean, if you use the ring in sinus augmentation, during the implant placement, first you put the ring in the sinus and then you place the implant through the ring. Uh, yeah, into from, the sinus from, from transcrestal approach. Yeah, from the yeah, transcrestal approach. So after implant placement, uh, you screw the fixation cap. And during, first, first the cover screw, and, yeah, then, and then the fixation cap. Also, you can use uh, some chlorhexidine gel for the fixation cap. Do you suggest it, Orjan? If I would go into the details, maybe it will be misunderstood. Uh, better uh, not to go into details okay. because we don't have so much time. It's very really important that you don't have a huge gap between the screws to avoid some uh, bacteria grows into in, in, in this gap. So mm -hmm. uh, if you work a little bit sterile, uh, and do not touch the tongue or the saliva of the patient and with the fingers, the scabs, just you work gently, you will not bring any bacteria into the screws, into the screw set, and there will be zero problem. So I didn't observe any any problem, you yeah. as well not. Yeah, I, I so didn't some, observe. So. Yeah. It is just only the concentration if someone touched too much everything during the operation yeah. and the screw doesn't fit very well and there is a small gap and then the bacteria can grow in this gap mm -hmm. which you brought inside. So yeah. that's why I was the mentioning of clerexid in gel. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Omar. The other question is, Dr. Osman Akunji, what's your opinion on the percentage of flap day sense in vertical augmentation cases? Thanks. So this is actually the most important question. Yeah. We have no data. We have no data. Uh, we know only partially from the reports of some colleagues. They did the first time. They said, uh, I had a failure when I used the boring. Uh, of course, they come mostly to me or to Bernd Kisnagen. They write us an email. And then it turns that they never been on a course. So they said, I heard it, I read an article, I did it. So when you talk a little bit in detail, you realize there have been everything made wrong, what could be wrong. Uh, there are also sometimes people, they attend a full day course or two day course, they still have problems with the dehiscence. But uh, Emre, as you remember by yourself, you just, the first time when you started the boring, yeah. uh, you said there are a lot of valuable information. As mm -hmm. I remember, you did the same course. Yes. Yes. Improbable. And, and yeah. now, now uh, Emre is an expert in, with his colleagues here in the university on the boring. They are performing without any uh, problems. Uh, maybe only small. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we already uh, performed almost uh, 30 or 35 vertical augmentation with bone rings, just vertical, not sinus. I'm talking yeah. about vertical. It's almost 35 yeah. augmentations with either autogenous or allograft bone rings. And we had just one uh, day sense, flap day sense, in just in one patient. Complete? Yes. Complete. Complete, yeah. So, uh, 
uh, then it well, is it depends. Yeah. Yeah. Then it is round about, let's say, three percent. Uh, but this will match to our uh, data as well. I would say you have uh, two, three percent dehiscence risk under best conditions. But if you start with it, you maybe have fifty percent, or the first case, hundred percent failure. But if you have too much failure, then something is not correctly done. Then you must reconsider the whole procedure. Something is uh, is then wrong. Uh, of course, it's like all augmentation cases in all around the world, in all the literature. Below 20%, nobody is uh, having, let's say, 100% success. Everybody is saying yeah. 20% is what we are expecting to having some failures. But in borings, we reduce this uh, this uh, risk a lot. Because the handling is very simple, but the sense risk is still there. Now we will start a new study, but these details I will not explain you here <laughs> because it will take another half an hour. But we are starting now. Uh, a new study, we, today we talk about it, how we can make the dehiscence risk less. Yeah. This, we are working on it. Maybe we are having in six months or one year uh, an answer for this. Yeah. We will scientifically uh, answer this question. Yes. Huh? We try, yeah. we try, we hopefully. We hopefully, yeah. Okay, another question? So there is no more questions, I guess. Okay, we then are very happy to um, have you here all around the world. Uh, and we will see us soon. Back. Dear colleagues, thank you for your uh, attention. Hope to see you soon in another webinar. Take care. Cheers. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank Bye -bye you. Bye-bye from Adana. Bye.